non rock a boatus must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. The, yeah, I love you, Jeff. Delusional. Yeah, delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Yes! Oh my God. What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go in the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. Well, I, yeah. got, I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when yeah. they're not. Take an amazing journey. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15, y'all. Welcome back, everybody, to the Gospel Heard Around the World. This is Apology Radio, guys. ApologiaStudios.com is where you go to get more, tons more, episodes cultish, sheologians, apologia radio, provoked, all that's there. And if you guys partner with us in this ministry, you get all kinds of additional content and you're going to be getting more, much more very, very soon. So sign up for all access. And when you guys do sign up for all access, you're going to get uh, the TV show, the after show, the academy. You're going to be getting a new show called Collision. You're going to be doing Ask Me Anything, a once a month time where we sit down together. You get on live with us. In that private stream, you can ask questions. We chat a bit, and uh, that's coming very soon as well for other shows. And so you're going to have access to us. We can talk. We can hang out together um, and ask questions. And so all that's at ApologiaStudios.com. Sign up for all access. You make everything we do possible. Everything you see happening on Apologia Studios platform is because of people just like you. And if you haven't done so yet, sign up for Bonson U. It is a free seminary-level education it is phenomenal. It's with one of the greats of church history, Dr. Greg Bonson, all at Bonson U, ApologiaStudios.com. It's free. You just got to set up an account, and you get access to Dr. Greg Bonson's uh, whole life's work, and uh, it'll bless your life. And so if you haven't done it yet, you're losing, you're missing out, and you're crazy um, because it's amazing, and it's all for free. Um for you, but um, it's being uh, paid for by yes. your brothers and sisters who are all access that pay for all that stuff in the streaming. So thank you to our all access partners who are helping us to bless the world with some amazing teaching. We are back this week. So much is going on. I'm a little, I'm a little punchy today because I am absolutely exhausted. There's a million things going on, some great stuff, and so um, yeah, uh, this this could be a, this could make for a very interesting show. And we are talking about some gay stuff today for sure. Um, <laughs> Some gay theology. And, I don't mean happy. And from the infamous, no, not, not in the <clears throat> traditional sense. Um, and it's from the infamous uh, Reverend uh, Brandon Robertson Oof. on his TikTok. And uh, I despise TikTok, can't stand TikTok. And so um, I don't even have a TikTok, but I, I pulled it up. And so we're going to review. Um, so I, I got a glimpse at a few of them. And I think it's really important stuff to engage with because if there were ever a charlatan, um, as an example, it'd be this guy right here. Ever, yeah. ever, ever an apostate who manipulates and um, is just just a man with low, low, low integrity in terms of how he engages with things, and the level of manipulation of this guy is just astonishing. And uh, so we're gonna deal with it. And um, that right there is Luke the Bear. Hi. That's not the girl over there. No, obviously it's not. Yeah, contrary to popular opinion of what can happen with a man with a beard. Um, but that's uh, over there is uh, Zach Conover. He is the director of communication for 
End Abortion Now, uh, which, by the way, you should go to End Abortion Now right now. Uh, partner with us, support, and uh, get your church there um, so you guys can get trained and equipped so you can start saving lives with us and be a part of everything that's happening across the country right now. I'm Jeff the Common Ninja, and this, this is the Bible. Is the Bible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The Word of God. Is the Word of God, but it's not just the Word of God. Did you have it rebound? It, this was a gift. Well, so people my keep house, sending them Bibles. So my house was, I would love one if anyone was You got listening. a whole shelf dedicated to just the Bible in your office. Let me tell you right now, one of the best things in this world and in this life that you will ever experience is this. <laughs> oh, That's not what I thought you were going to do. That smell right there, that smell of a fresh... How's it feel? Oh, supple. Feel good? Supple and... and oh, cover? yeah, please do. Yes, cover? yes, please do. Oh, that man. is... I'm about to do like a a, a free advertisement that's here. Right. That's nice. For an, is that's it good right. to go? That's right. Okay. It's the right number. It um, is. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's weird. I don't know why. Um, All right. Uh, so this is a gift that John gave to me, a brother named John, uh, and it's from Cherry Hill Bibles, uh, handcrafted in old Michigan. Yeah, hey. old Michigan, handcrafted old in Michigan. Stomping grounds. Oh, my old there you go, Cherry Hill Bibles. Old. And, oh, Zach already sent me. And let me just tell you guys right now, you see that yap? That's called a yap. What are you yapping about? Full yap. That's a full, look at that. that right there. See how they touch together? <clears throat> Do you see how they touch? Look at this. This is so your pages are protected right here. I'm, do, I'm doing a full-on advertisement right now, but it's this like is a, called a yap. It's like a Bible cocoon. Yeah, and they made it for people like me who just uh, end up mangling their Bibles. Yeah, that's to protect it from all yeah. the bananas getting smashed If you smashed have little kids, the, then that will That's do right. It, yeah. Yeah. Look at that yap. No, um, your book can get through that yap. Yep, yeah, that's right. So this is um, yeah. so soft and just supple and amazing, and it supple. smells so... It feels good, too. Man, the best part supple. is the smell. Um there ain't nothing better than getting a new Bible and cracking it open and, and, and open. The cracking it open. <laughs> cracking it open. <laughs> and just, just bury your face. This is me. <laughs> oh. And I taught my children well, too, because I showed my son. He's like, what? Let me see that. And he's like, oh, this is amazing. And the first thing he did is he yap. was like, he goes, he goes, oh. And he was, you know, that's when you know you've raised your children well. Eat that so scroll, young you scribe. Eat that eat scroll that and scroll, put baby. it in your belly. Um. So uh, Cherry Hill Bible, so I, this was a, an amazing gift, and it came at just the right time because um, my house almost burned down at 3 a.m. Saturday morning, and a, a battery, they think, uh, exploded in my laundry room, and by the grace of God, in so many providential events that I won't even go over right now, God got me up in any other room, no smoke, no, uh, no fire alarms going off the entire time, which is crazy because it was black smoke everywhere. A pretty substantial fire, did, did some significant damage, uh, but God preserved our lives. And then the very next day, um, uh, Christine came over to my house to help, and she was just such a gift to us. She's so, so good to us. And, and then, like, you know, I'm dealing with all that, and thank you, Lord, for preserving our lives. And then there's this box that she brings over, and it's filled with this box beautiful Bible. She says, oh, John said this is a gift to you. And so Cherry Hill Bibles, they are something. Let me tell you what. Uh, these things are amazing. I love this. Pretty. I love it. So there you go. It's real nice. I just needed it. I read from it and I needed to show you what it was because, you know, uh, don't be hating, I guess. It, it, I mean, it even looks old. Like it looks like a Puritan used it or something. Oh. It's like it's like a pair of jeans. It's like worn in a little bit yeah. Maybe some acid wash on it why don't we just have this whole episode just we just pet this the whole time we just take turns petting at what it. point is that the spine is that bragging the yeah i look you're uh, causing if, people to covet your if john bible. watches this john pastor luke would i would love, love a cherry hill bible Cher in the name too that's where is it such a good cherry hill brand. michigan cherry hill I gotta check the check where that's Cherry got a ring to Hill it. Bibles. It's it's nice. So thank you, John, for blessing me with this spectacular Bible. It is amazing. I think these are like these are like five hundred fifty dollars. These are expensive. It's a really amazing gift. Uh, and that yap though. Yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna preach from it or? <laughs> uh, I preached a Sunday from it. Oh. You better oh, believe I did. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah amazing. Um, so yeah. Right now, everybody who's in the stream, we're going to deal with some seriously gay theology from the Reverend Brandon <laughs> Robertson. Um, but before I do that, I want to make sure I announce to everybody how you guys can participate in some ministry with us right now. Um, we're not asking anything of you except for you to use your mouth and use your hands and feet and, and, and be a part of this with us. Uh, so much is happening right now. We have bills of equal protection happening across the country, as we've announced to you guys. This is an unprecedented moment where it's not one state or two states during a legislative session. Uh, this is happening across the entire country right now, and, and it's amazing. We have... Uh, we can't keep up with all we of it. We can't keep up with it because it's happening and more being added 
can constantly. Um, uh, so we have Arizona, Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, Kentucky, Indiana. Uh, one is happening: Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Idaho, Ohio. Ohio. Now is 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 we got a confirmation that in a commitment for Ohio. We're working on Tennessee right now. Um, it's just happening across the country, and so all glory to God. Uh, this week, right now, today, South Carolina had something going on. Um, and so be in prayer for South Carolina. Um, we have next week two events that you can participate in with us. You can meet us if you're around this area. I'm going to be in Denver, Colorado. Our bill has a hearing in Denver, Colorado with Representative Bottoms. It's going to be next Friday, the 17th, at the Denver State Capitol. So if you are in, in Colorado, come and say hi. Come meet with me. Come and testify at the hearing. You can do that. Show up at the Capitol. Show your support. I'll be in Denver next Friday, February 17th. Uh, Zach and Carmen are actually going to be in Kentucky at Frankfurt in Frankfort, Kentucky, at the State Capitol in Kentucky for the rally for the bill uh, t- uh, to abolish abortion in Kentucky. That is taking place on February 17th. Frankfort, State Capitol, uh, at 10 a.m., Abolish Abortion Kentucky. Our brothers out there are, are putting that on, and so that's all taking place next Friday. And then the week after that, we're going to be in South Carolina on the 25th in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, at the Capitol for the bill that's happening there in South Carolina. So I will be in those two places. Zach and the team will be in Frankfurt next Friday, 17th. And so come and join us. Uh, more is coming, so be in preparation for next that. Next Wednesday. If you're in Arizona, yeah. if you're in Arizona... Don't forget our state. That's right. If you're, I was, I was getting to it, guys. Okay. Just making sure. If you're in Arizona... We need you, if you're a pastor, or if you've got a pastor, which I hope you do, um, we need you to show up at Arizona Community Church at 11 a.m. Arizona Community Church is on rural, um, just Between north Rain of... Between Rain Warner. Yeah, it's er. just north of Chandler, right? Is that right? You're, you're right. Yeah. Between, Between Rain and Warner. Yeah. North of Ray. There you go. North of Ray. Yeah. That's right. Ray. Right. Um, so Craig it Ray. is uh, Arizona Community Church. Thank you. To Pastor Bill and to the staff at Arizona Community Church for giving up the space to us. Uh, 11 a.m., February the 15th, next Wednesday, Arizona Pastors, we need you there. It's a uh, all-hands-on-deck moment. We're going to feed you lunch. We're going to introduce you some, to some stuff that's going on here. We've got a bill here in the state of Arizona. We need you there. So Arizona Christians, tell your pastors this, this next Wednesday, Arizona Community Church, 11 a.m. And uh, before we get into the show today, very quickly... Conover, can you let everyone know what they can do to help us with our bill right now in the state of Arizona? Yeah, so our representative, uh, Corey Magar, uh, was able to get our bill in just before the deadline, praise God, here in Arizona. Um, As it stands right now, there are, wouldn't you know it, some pretty dedicated players uh, in the uh, pro-life side of things here in Arizona that are committed to opposing our efforts and making sure that the bill doesn't get a hearing. Um, So... We would ask um, that you would please contact these people. Um, Our bill, if it doesn't have a a chance to get heard, then abortion won't be ended in Arizona. And so it's very, very important that we contact these particular individuals and make sure that that we ask that the bill can get a hearing. Um, So contact, I feel bad for butchering his last name. Nguyen. Quang Nguyen is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee here in Arizona, which is the committee that the bill would need to go in order to get a hearing at. Um, Please contact his office. Uh, The number is 602-926-3258 and ask uh, Mr. Nguyen to do the right thing before God and allow HB 2706, that's the number of the bill, uh, to be heard. To have a hearing without delay uh, right away, please call and ask that. And then also, do we want to include yes. the second call yes. to action? Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about uh, Kathy Herod, who's the uh, president of the Center of Arizona Policy here. She is responsible for uh, not only decriminalizing abortion in the state of Arizona, uh, striking, uh, helping strike that law off the record that would have held uh, mothers who killed their children accountable uh, for abortion. She brags about the fact that she uh, took it off the, the Arizona... I took it out of Arizona law. So yeah. Kathy brags about the fact that she de- decriminalized abortion for mothers. Not only that, she opposed the uh, first Bill of Equal Protection and Abolition that we helped get uh, put in a couple years back. And it looks like she's going to uh, be uniform in her opposition of that. And so please 
uh, let her know uh, by calling her office here. A lot of Christians in Arizona especially need to know uh, that uh, Kathy Herod and the Center for Arizona Policy are not, in fact, on our team when it comes to the cause of life right. and the protection of these fatherless children. She raises children. money for it, right? and she pretends to be pro-life, but she actually does not believe that a, uh, that a woman who murders her child should ever be punished for it. Right. In the womb. That's right. Yeah. And so please uh, call CAP's office at 602-424-2525, or you can email info at azaction.org and let her know uh, graciously that if she does oppose the bill, again, as she has already demonstrated, we will let every church, every Christian, every pastor in Arizona know that she not only decriminalized abortion, uh, but that she is um, actively standing in the way, and we're going to make sure that everybody knows mm-hmm. that she is continually uh, resolved to opposing it. Kathy Herod professes to be pro- pro-life. She raises and money. Christian. And she, she and, and to be a believer, she raises money at churches for a Center yep. for Arizona Policy. She tells people she's pro-life. She tells people she le- believes that it's life from the moment of fertilization. But Kathy Herod is one of the greatest enemies and obstacles to the end of abortion judicial end of abortion in the state of Arizona. That's a fact. I would debate her in public, moderated public debate on this issue. Kathy Herod, if you see this, uh, the offer stands. Let's do a moderated public debate on this issue. I will be happy to bring out all the evidence of uh, your compromise in this area and the fact that you are one of the greatest enemies to the abolition of abortion in the state of Arizona. And uh, I'd be happy to do that. That offer still stands. So please, everybody, if you're a believer in the state of Arizona, loves the Lord, loves these children, wants to stand for these children, and equal protection, contact not only Nguyen, demand the hear- that we get a hearing for this bill, uh, and also contact Kathy Herod and let her know very respectfully, graciously, but firmly that if she gets in the way of this bill and doesn't support it, that you will make sure every Christian knows. We are going to make sure every minister of the gospel knows. I was just talking to a very well-known pastor in the state of Arizona, very well-known, um, just the other day. Great conversation. When I told him about Kathy Herod and Cap's um, dealings over the last couple of years and what they've done, he was shocked because he knows many Christians that give to that organization, Mm -hmm. and he couldn't believe her doctrinal position and the fact that she's opposing the abolition of abortion. And uh, and that's one pastor notified, and he's going to notify that church and others, I'm sure. And we're just going to keep this going until every Christian in the state of Arizona knows that CAP is not consistent, and they are certainly not operating as Christians, and they are ultimately in the way of uh, the establishment of justice for these preborn children. Yep. Uh, yeah, before we get too far into this, I uh, just want to thank our sponsors as well, people we partner with, and that would be the Armored Republic, which you can visit them at ar500armor.com, and of course, New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. And I happen to be wearing this shirt today on purpose. Did you? Yeah. I actually got this from the Creation Museum, so thank you, Ken Ham and Lalo Gunther uh, for a great time you showed us in Kentucky. Lalo's and, the uh, man. Yeah, Ken, uh, Ken refuses to give the gays the rainbow. Right. Mm. And I saw this shirt, and I was like, yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap that. So, you anyways, that? Yeah. we'll talk about that. Care, you gotta be careful bit. where you wrap that. That's like, true. If you if you wrap that near <laughs> the uh, Stonewall Inn in New York, like you know, things can go bad for you. This is true. For sure. Ask you, Carmen for sure. Yeah, no comment. Thank you, Olivia, <laughs> Louise, uh, for that. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Matt, uh, so much for that. We appreciate your support, and uh, we're grateful for you. Let's get into it, shall Let's we, boys? It. It's uh, the Reverend. That's right. So the this is irrever- a reverential. Reverend. This is Reverend Brandon Robertson. You guys have seen him before, maybe you've seen him. He's got a popular old TikTok channel. Um, TikTok, and. Um, he does Which all kinds is not of stuff. An accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, he does all kinds of stuff on gay theology, um, encouraging people in uh, homosexuality, and um, yeah, he also uh, I I noted that there's a lot of manipulation that goes on with him, and um, and we're gonna take a look at some of that today. Uh, but um, this is Brandon Robertson. I actually, interestingly, I announced this last time when we did this. I had Brandon Robertson was a was a friend on Facebook if that means anything really uh for a while a long while and uh I think if I remember correctly it was when SCOTUS happened with um you know Gay Mirage um I was going through my feed when all that was going on and I see this guy that I don't like know personally but he's a friend on my my page I see him like like glory hallelujahing 
uh, the kingdom of God has arrived in response to SCOTUS, um, you know, wow, doing thanks. the gay mirage, which shocked me because I had seen some posts from the guy before, you know, professing Christian. He was going to a Bible college, and uh, then I see him, you know, extolling the goodness and uh, uh, majesty of uh, gay mirage, and the kingdom of God has arrived. Wow. When that was his response. So I remember, I don't use the comment back and forth. I, I saw that. I was like, I'm going to say something about that. What exactly do you mean the kingdom of God has arrived in response to um, the proclamation of Gay Mirage? And so I've seen I've seen him from a ways back, and I've seen him grow up a bit, and I've seen him actually uh, become someone that is is a really well-known apostate. And, um, and uh, he's popular in the LGBTQ community. Uh, circles as uh, somebody who who tells you that you can love Jesus, love Scripture, and also love your um, uh, sexual perversions, and um, and I'm going to prove that in a minute to you. By the way, it's not just homosexuality that he extols the beauties of and glories of. Um, but let's get into it. So before I do, do you guys want to say anything? Or we just go, get to let's it. Let's go. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this is him on talking about the Bible. So I'll go ahead and pull this up. Nope, that's not... See, I am not good at the old... MacBooks. See, this is like... What is... What is the... How do you get rid of this now? I don't know. See, this is this is going to jam me oh, up. Oh, we're starting to get all kinds of fun comments. Yeah. Uh, guys, I'm, I, I haven't been a... I haven't been a MacBook guy. Look, I can't even get this off. Hey, send Carmen over or something because <laughs> I have a good... Do you know how to get this off? I have to I, save all time. I just I touched help. it, and now like I have this in the screen, and there's like double screen here. I, I, I don't, don't want this to happen. Do you know how to do this, Luke? I don't know what's going on there. I don't know how to get this off this off the screen. It won't, it won't go away. I haven't used TikTok a day in my life. Well, it's not TikTok. It's just, it's, um, it's just Mac. I don't know how... Okay. Look, I can't even move it now. See, this is why I hate Macs, guys. No one's going to convince me that Macs are awesome. Or Apple products. In or, I, no yeah. one's going to convince me. I, I'd rather, While I'd rather we sit just here have, with our Apple Are you laptops? trying to get a different video? <laughs> no, I'm trying to get this little thing off. This screen just popped up. I want to get it to go away, and I can't get it to so go you, away. So, buddy, are you trying to get to a different video? No, I'm trying to... Now it's... There you go. Okay. Well, there, nope. Look, see, it did that. Oh, look see, at that. That's fun. Look at that. It can do that, which doesn't help me in the slightest. So are we? Are we sending some? some me, I'm sorry, everyone. Our technical tech team. support. Tech geek support. Squad. Me the geek squad. I need the geek squad to come over and help, uh, so we can get on with the show today. Yeah. Um, in in the meantime. Maybe well, there you we go. Could, uh, hold did on. We get it. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Uh, there you go. There you go. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. There, there you go. We're getting somewhere. Well, I don't know what happened there, but. Thanks for bearing with us. Everybody. Yes, everybody. Sorry yes. about that. This is me and my skills with the the Mac. Okay. So uh, here we go. The question that came to Brandon was, again, what do you actually believe about the Bible? ...and discussing the difference between progressive views of the Bible and conservative views of the Bible. The conservative view of the Bible is so cut and dry, black and Full white screen, and simple. They say the Bible is the inerrant word of God. There are no errors. As you understand it is what it means. And you need to accept it as the absolute truth on all matters that it talks about. This makes it really easy for a conservative Christian to pick up the Bible and say, I read a passage, it made me uncomfortable, or I disagreed with it, or I didn't understand it, but I've got to believe it because it's the word of God and that settles it. But we literally look at no other book in the world like that. Isn't that somewhat the point? I wonder why that is. We don't look at any other book like that with that kind of authority. I, I wonder why that is. Do you think, Brandon, that it could be because of the uniqueness of that revelation, the fact that there, according to that revelation, is only one true and living God, an eternal God, none before, none after, a transcendent God, a God that is um, spirit, a God that is um, triune, do you think there's something to that claim uh, that this God revealed himself in his word that would make it different than other books? Right. That other, other human literature or even other religious literature. Like there's something unique about the claim that this is the true and living God speaking. Like when Jesus there you is go. talking about the revela uh, re resurrection right. in Matthew, he says to the Jews of his day, he says, have you not read what was spoken to you by God. So he equates the reading of Scripture as, some, as God actually speaking. That is God's speech. 
He's doing the revealing. This is the only God. There's a creator-creation distinction. He's the creator. We're the creatures and the creation, and he's speaking. And so isn't that sort of obvious? We don't treat any other book like that for good reason, I imagine. Like there's a difference between me having a conversation with the Lord of glory and me having a conversation with my three-year-old. There's, there's a difference, right? When he speaks, it's at a different level and a different authority than when my three-year-old speaks, right? Isn't that the case? Mm-hmm. And so how could this be something that is, you know, uh, we don't understand, I can't understand why we would treat this book this way. Because literally the Lord Jesus makes the claim that the scriptures they held in that day contain God's speech. This, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Or when the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, he says, all scripture is theonoustos, it is breathed out by God. He's talking about their scripture. What's in this revelation? Mm-hmm. And yeah, he'll go on in a moment here to say, like, actually, this is a collection of books. Yeah, forgive me, duh. It's a collection of books. It's a lot of different authors over a long period of time in different geographical locations, but it is one unified message. And the claim of this revelation is that it is theonoustos. It is breathed out by God. It is revelation from God. So how could we actually think it's strange that we would look to a revelation like this that is the revelation of God, like it or leave it, the, the claim of the book is that it is the revelation of God. Why is it strange that we would say the revelation of God is ultimate, It's the standard. It's the reference point. The reason you say that is because God is the reference point. He's the foundation of it all. Of course, it's different than how we handle other books. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, he's complaining that we treat the Bible as if it's authoritative. And then he's going to attempt to authoritatively tell us why that's wrong and we shouldn't treat anything oh, I author- like authoritatively i like that his that's authority good. is above it based yeah, on exactly. whose word exactly right. Right. your yeah. word brandon's word is more important especially when it comes to ancient literature when we study ancient literature that's not the bible we need to learn the culture the context the language the beliefs and backgrounds and philosophies of the world from which that text comes from to begin understanding what the text is actually saying of course conservative theology doesn't hold the bible to those standards and when Excuse me. This is not true. This is the manipulation that I referred to. I'm not going to challenge a man of being a manipulator unless I have proof. And that is the kind of manipulation that I'm talking about. For him to say that, you know, when you go to these other ancient texts, you know, you're doing like background, author, what were they thinking, like who were they talking to, the audience, all those things. Like that's what you do when you do ancient literature, but that's not what conservative Christians do when they go to the Bible. I'm sorry, Brandon, I know you went to Bible college, and I'm confident that in a Bible college you had to have taken a hermeneutics class, or you knew they were available. Because what does hermeneutics teach you? It te- it's the art and science of biblical interpretation. And what does it say? Is it, yes, this is the revelation of God, but you need to take into account who's the author. Mm-hmm. When was it written? Who is the audience? What were they thinking at that time? What's the context? All those things. Brandon, you're talking about what every Christian conservative Bible seminary, good or bad, yeah. does when they approach the Bible. It's mm-hmm. called exegesis. Yeah. And historically... That's what you find in the Christian tradition is exegesis. Go to the text. Draw out from the text its meaning. And you know, Brandon, I know you're not an ignorant man. You're a sinful, wicked man, but you are uh, not just an apostate, but you are a man who knows that there's this thing called the Reformed world and the Reformed tradition. I know you're not ignorant. You heard Christians like me talking about hermeneutics and exegesis. So you are deceptive, Brandon. You're trying to pretend like, you know, conservative Christians, they just go to the Bible and say, that's the Bible. Word says it. That's the words right there. That's not how Christians approach the Bible. Are there people like that? Yeah, there's a, there's a rare breed of people that have no concern for context or consistency, but those people are ignorant. They're as ignorant as you, Brandon, because you know that the Christian tradition teaches hermeneutics, right. exegesis, go to the text, draw out the meaning, author, intention, uh, context, audience, time. When was this written? What was going on in the surrounding areas? What were the philosophies of those who that the, the author is interacting with? What was the worldview? You're just talking about hermeneutics and exegesis. Right. That's all you're talking every, about. Every hermeneutics class or exe- exegetical class I ever took that was one of the first things that was mentioned <laughs> was the rule the rule of hermeneutics is you, you have to take these things into consideration in your interpretation 
of the text, but there's just a duplicity in his statement. First, it was, oh, we don't want to take this view of the Bible where it's accepted as what it is, scripture, as the word of God. And then he equates that with not taking into account uh, the particular audience who wrote it for what purpose it was written what's the context all of those things there's right. just there's a duplicitous kind of um you know way of presenting this that he's i think it's what the apostle paul talks about in second corinthians 4 when he says we've renounced a disgraceful underhanded ways we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with god's word but by the open statement of the truth we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of god yeah this is this is cunning right it's it's shameful disgraceful underhandedness. Right, because what he's doing is he's saying, look, there's these two categories. On the one hand is the category of guys like Brandon Robertson that wants to take into account the worldviews of those, of the day, the author, the audience, you know, context, what's going on around. And then there's the simpletons that just accept the Bible as the Word of God. They just look at it and go, it's the Word of God. That's Actually, Brandon, you are fully aware that isn't the case. You know that that is not the categories we have to deal with. It's either Brandon's way where you actually do this in an intelligent way to say, what did the author actually mean and what's going on? Or you just go to the Bible and say, that's the Bible. It's the word of God. Believe it. Like, you know, that's that's all we've got is the simpleton versus, you know, the Brandon Robertson's. Uh, here's my challenge. Anybody, um, go to Amazon. Uh, do a search in the search bar. Look, type in the word hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Look it up. See how many books come up training you to actually do the art and science of biblical interpretation and how every single one of them gives you this standard. Who wrote it? Who's the audience? When was it written? What was the context surrounding it? All those things. And, and how does this work with other scripture and content and, and consistency? And, um, and, and at ever, I, I challenge you to go to Reform Theological Seminary, Westminster Seminary, go to Whitfield Theological Seminary, go to Moody, go to Dallas, go to wherever, pick a school and look through their courses and see if you see a course in there about hermeneutics. This is why this man challenges me in terms of um, the the deception. <laughs> um, patience running. I say patience. Yeah. 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 Maybe he thought it was pronounced exit Jesus. <laughs> Uh, he's good at that. Yeah. He's very good at Just that. Hashtag yeah. dad joke. There you go. Dad joke. For days. <laughs> For days. Here we go. More from Brendan. Progressives come in and say, well, actually, we need to look at each book of the Bible and each chapter of the Bible and ask, what is the context? Who is the author? Who is it being written to? What was the intention? What's the purpose? What was the belief systems in that era of history? Conservatives say, look at you just twisting the Bible. Look at you doing all these gymnastics instead of just accepting what the Bible what? plainly says. And in a conversation or a debate, literally backwards here, what we just said. And, 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 <laughs> but here's the point. We we do we I mean we operate according to the, the procedure of exegesis and hermeneutics in order to come to what the Bible is saying, right? So there is a process by which we extract the author's meaning from the text. But that's the point. We're not reading into it a foreign meaning. Right. We're trying to understand what Paul wrote. That would be Isaac or, Jesus. or what the gospel writers wrote. And and that's the point is we want to get the meaning that the text is teaching from the text, mm -hmm. not arrive with a certain set of presuppositions and lay them on top of the text. Yeah, I dare you, Brandon Robertson, I dare you, friend, uh, to try to find that in Calvin. Try to find it in Knox. Try to find that in Luther. That just, well, I don't care. Bible says it. Well, what, what was the context? I don't care. Like that, they, that's the tradition. They all take that into account. So I, it's almost like, who are you talking to? Uh, where's this come from? Because actually when I've interacted with um, lesbian or gay theologians that, that, that let's go to the Bible together. Let's, let's look at Leviticus 18. Let's look at Leviticus 20. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Like, let's do this work. Let's go to the text. When I've had conversations with them, they don't want to do what you're saying, Brandon. They don't want to go to the actual, what does the Greek say? Where's that word come from? What is Paul doing with those two words, arsenos and koites? What is he doing with those words? Why is he pulling them together in this, this word? Where's he getting that from? Is he getting it from somewhere? Like, does he, was he reading something in Scripture? What's the origin of that word? It's actually the Christians that I know that want to actually do that. Go to the text author, background, audience, context, words, draw out the meaning of the text. It's actually, in my experience, 
the lesbian and gay theologians that want to disregard the text and say that it's not ultimately authoritative mm. in all the things that it says, which actually is what Brandon Robertson really believes. They're in his TikTok videos. He does not believe that this revelation is fully authoritative, that everything in it is the truth. That's actually what, what Brandon Robertson believes, is that there are myths in this revelation. He said that. I just did a collision video yesterday on that. He says that there are myths and stories in here that are just not true. He calls himself a Christian agnostic, which is like saying that you're a bird dog, right? <laughs> it's, it's two categories that don't mm -hmm. mix, like a Christian who believes like in good revelation from God. God has spoken. There's absolute truth there. There's objective truth that has truth and meaning outside of my experience, my community, my location in time or geography. It is true outside of me, my likes, my emotions, all those things. It's objective outside of me, and God has spoken it, and he's the original knower and tells me there are things that I can know. Agnosticism is a, the word a or the negation of, and no, gnosis or knowledge, and so it's without knowledge. Thomas Huxley created, or coined that term. It has a, it has an etymology to it, has an original point. You come into contact with it, and a meaning that we have for agnosticism today, it's without knowledge. Knowledge is impossible. So how can you go and say, I'm a Christian agnostic. I believe that knowledge is possible as a Christian. God has spoken. We can know things from God, and we can't know things. Brandon says in that video, he says, I don't know. You don't know. We can't know. This man is a bundle of contradictions. But I sure do know that. <laughs> yeah. But he knows that for there, sure. There's, yeah. a, there's a great point in there about just, you know, there could be pride in the sense of I know everything, but then there can also be a pietistic pride that says I know nothing. Yeah. Right? I'm ignorant of everything. Mm. Which, yeah. And that's, that's prideful because right. you need to humble yourself under God's truth. And that is there are certain things that we can know for certain because yep. God has spoken clearly to them. And I would just say, in addition to that, can I just say that this is why it's so important for Christians to be catechizing their children? Amen, bro. <laughs> because this kind of stuff right here, um, look, look at the follower count. Look at the likes. Yeah. Look, at, look, at, look at all of these things. We need to be teaching our children, what rule hath God given to direct us that we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, are the rule. It's the rule mm -hmm. uh, that directs us how we should love and glorify God. And so this is what we need to be uh, inculcating in our children. So that way they're prepared to encounter this That's because right. this is a mess. Yes. Yep. Conservative way seems superior because it's so clear. Anybody can understand the conservative argument that you should be able to believe everything in the Bible, pick it up, whatever it says, just take it as you understand it. And that's the truth. But that isn't true. That's not what the Bible is. For starters, the Bible's not one book, but a library of books written by dozens of people over thousands of years in different places around the world, in different languages, with different philosophies and po political situations. And so when we look at the Bible, we need to ask each individual book and even each individual chapter, when was this written? Who's writing this? To whom is it being written to? What is the purpose? What genre is this text? And as you do those things, as you ask those... And do you know what he's doing? As he's having this conversation, he's having the exact same conversation that happens in every Christian Bible college and every Christian seminary in the world. Mm -hmm. The right. same conversation. He's just talking about hermeneutics and exegesis. The conversation that is happening constantly in God's church with faithful ministers. So this is all deceptive, right? Over here in the LGBT world, we do our <laughs> we do our we do our stuff like this, yeah. and over there in that conservative Christian world, they just they just look at it and go, "Book says that, I believe it." No need to look at context, no need to author background. When was it written? None of that stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, the truth is is the best you're going to get in this field in terms of background, authorship, style, genre, where, when. Um, surrounding information, the best you're going to get hands down without question is from conservative Christian Christians in history mm -hmm. and their commentary. Yeah, let's just call them Christians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'll give you, yeah, yeah. Orthodox, Bible-believing yeah. You're going to get the mass of them is going to be from Christians writing these backgrounds and commentaries and books that will tell you exactly that. I would say, you know, uh, Go to a, a solid Christian commentary, big fat books, 
and open it up and watch how the author will say, here's when it was written, this is the author, here's what he said elsewhere, here's who he's writing to, and this is actually where we think he wrote it and, and the time in which he wrote it, because we know from the surrounding issues going on in those days, from these historical writings, this is what they were doing, this is what was happening outside of that in that context, on and on and on. The best you're going to get to learn in terms of the mass coming up to us in history is from those Christians yep. who are doing those hermeneutics, and Brandon, they're the ones who taught you those hermeneutics. You went to Bible college... That's where you learn this. And now you're pretending like it's over here in the LGBT community we do this. We approach the Bible like this. But over here, these conservatives, they just take it for granted. They don't do the work that we do. Brandon, you're lying. You're not telling the truth. You're being deceptive. Because that's just good old, plain, unadulterated just, hermeneutics. Just curious, do you know where he went to Bible college? I think it was Moody. Oh. I, in my mind, I'm remembering him mentioning things about worse. Moody. Um, that's it. I could be wrong, but for some reason, Moody's in my mind. Okay. Moody's on my mind. Uh, could be a song. Okay, here we go. Questions. You begin to unpack layers of meaning in the text that are not obvious if you're just reading it from your modern perspective with a surface level reading. When you engage the Bible from that historical critical perspective, you unlock so much that's not there. Can I just make a comment here? Um, reading the Bible from your modern perspective, Brandon, is what you do. You engage in right. eisegesis. <laughs> right. You approach the Bible That's not hilarious. as an historical text with an historical meaning, a consistent text that consistently speaks to something. You are the one that actually goes to it with your modern mind and looks at it and says, well, that's just, you know, he's wrong about that. Like, you're the, you're the guy, Brandon, that said that Jesus had to repent of his racism. True. Right? You're the one that reads all your leftist your politics and political ideology into the text and then accuses the Lord of glory of being a racist. You're the guy that takes your modern interpretation and understanding to the text and you eisegete. You don't exegete. You don't follow the same rules that you're actually claiming here. You go to the text and you read your modern sexual ethics into the text because the sexual ethics you promote aren't in the text. They are decried by the text. They are militated against by the text. And yet you read your ideology and sexual ethics into the text. You try to get around plain statements of scripture where it's just clear, clear, clear. It cannot be controverted. It is right there. It is apparent and it's not in one place or two places or three. It's everywhere. It's thematic. It's everywhere. You you read those texts and you say, that's not authoritative. Or actually, I think that if we read this thing into it, then we'll have a better understanding it attempting to subvert it. That's what you do, Brandon. And uh, I, I was saying earlier, and some of you guys might be saying I've been really tough on Brandon. I am. Uh, the way that you're supposed to be. You see that the serrated edge in Scripture is reserved for men like this. Apostate men who try to lead people astray who are unstable. This man is dangerous. My only input here, though, is to say this. The clear, clearly the man is a messenger from Satan. Clearly the man is being used for, for Satan's purposes. But to be honest with you... Um, I don't think Satan put his best into this guy because the the contradictions are so glaring and obvious. You're not even good at what you do, Brandon. You're a terrible apostate, and it's easy to refute every single one of your two-minute videos. Every single one. Um, so there's my... I was going to say, we're the ones that are always being accused of being old-fashioned, so that's just hilarious to me that he's accused us of being modern. You, you know, this it reminds me of a, a saying: you don't you don't break God's rules, you break yourself trying. And I think the same is true with God's word. I think one of the common threads of these apostates is to try to render the unity of Scripture meaningless, right? So Jesus said, "What God has joined together, let no man tear asunder," and that includes His word. So if the Scriptures say all the prophets bear witness about Him. And that's Jesus, um, then there is a cohesive unity there that can't be fractured. And if you listen to everything being presented here, it's how to break, how to jumble, how to entangle mm -hmm. ourselves within this until all, all of it's rendered meaningless, right. ultimately. Right. You know, Pastor James, I know, would love, 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 love uh, to debate Brandon Robertson on the text, the specific text that Brandon tries to mangle from Leviticus 18 
20, Romans chapter 1, and on. Um, and the so clobber passages, the, as they the, call the quote, them. quote-unquote the clobber co- passages. Um, they're just <laughs> passages from Scripture that speak. And uh, so, Brandon, you know, if you want to get into this arena and you want to do the exegesis and the hermeneutics, let's just do that. I know James would be happy to do that with you. You know, he's a Greek scholar. He's worked on Bible translation uh, committees. He, um, he, he knows the Greek text. He can do the historical exegesis with you. Why don't you do a public debate over these issues with someone who actually knows the text? I mean, honestly, if it's, if it's the conservatives that just don't approach the Bible like you, you shouldn't have any problem entering into the arena with, say, someone like Dr. James White, who, right. who knows the historical uh, stuff. You know, he knows the audience. He knows the background, knows the language. Um, Brandon, do it. I know James would leap at the opportunity to discuss those issues with you. So, you know, you claim that the conservatives don't do what you do. So let's just see in a public debate who actually does it. Right? I mean, that's the claim you're making. Let's see who actually does it. I I know I'm going on a limb here, but I know know James well enough to know he would leap at the opportunity to have that discussion with you. So, Brandon, do it. I'd be excited to see it. I'd probably show up for that. I mean, we're really busy right now, but I'd make time for that to take a look at that. I think it'd be helpful. So uh, let's, let's finish that video. On a basic, simple, surface-level reading of the text. The problem is, again, that the progressive way of interacting with Scripture is complex. It's not black and white. And so when somebody asks a question like, well, then what do you actually believe in the Bible or about the Bible? It's impossible to simply answer that question because I need to know what text you're talking about and what topic the text is on and who wrote the text and what the purpose of that text was. The Bible is a complex library and our engagement with it should be nuanced and complex. I believe the Bible is an incredible book. It is one of the foundations of my faith. I love studying it. I love teaching it. But I don't just take every word as literally true because that's not what the authors intended. Seems to be the MO is to nuance things out of existence. And so you can't come to a definitive position on anything except the fact that we can't come to a definitive position. He's confident about that. (coughs) Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Proverbs 35. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Very different perspective. We can go on for days about that, but very different perspective from uh, Brandon Robertson here. So let's uh, take a look at another one here. So that was one he did on the Bible, and... um, there are so many, and uh, we should just do these on a regular basis. Um, uh, there is um, one here. Here we go. This is Brandon Robertson. Reverend, by the way, let me remind you, uh, top of his page here, look at this. See, Rev, Rev Brandon Robertson. Reverend. Okay, Reverend Brandon Robertson. This is his video titled, Segs is Good. Um, <laughs> did, did it really? Segs? Yeah, yeah. He means sex, right? This is yeah, just a ridiculous yeah. scare tactic. I thought you were being silly. Uh, no, that's what oh the... It's gosh. S-E-G-G-S. Oh sex is good. Of course, porn leads to all types of immoral sex acts. Thoughts. It's a terrible addiction. Leads to divorce. Porn is awful. And now, Reverend Brandon Robertson is going to respond to that comment. Perpetuated by purity culture. You might not like porn. You may personally decide that porn is not good for you. And yes, there is evidence that porn can lead to addiction. However, to say that all porn is evil and bad and that porn always leads to immoral sex acts and even more immoral crimes like murder is absolutely absurd. I'm a Christian pastor, but I have a lot of friends that also work in the adult film industry. And they are lovely people. They are not immoral people. They are not leading people to do great immoral acts, and they themselves aren't doing great immoral acts. You don't have to demonize sex and sexuality and sexual expression (laughs) and sexual art as something that should be despised, because it's actually a gift from God. No, you're the one demonizing sex. (laughs) You're the one making it demonic and celebrating demonic departures from God's created order concerning sex. That's what you're doing. I mean, there were so many things that started off with him saying he's a Christian pastor and it was downhill from there. Yeah. So he says, uh, no, there is evidence that does, you know, lead to addiction and that's <laughs> incontrovertible. Yeah, well, it um, is an addiction. It's incontrovertible <laughs> that, uh, that it does. And, um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing here to say that the people, these, this is just art. See, it's always a way to use a euphemism to get around, like, what's actually yeah. going on. Boy, we love to do that as sinners, don't we? Like, you know, we, we call it um, 
uh, reproductive health. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, reproductive reproductive rights, freedom. Freedom. Yeah. Reproductive rights. When we're talking about the unjustified taking of human life, so we use a euphemism like we don't want to say the baby in the womb, and so we say, well, the fetus in the fetus that's there. Well, fetus is a Latin word. It refers to the newborn offspring of a creature. So in an instance of a human, it's a baby. So it's, it fetus just means baby. But you use the euphemism to get around the fact that it's a baby in the womb. It's a child in the womb. It's your offspring. And so this is just what we do. So in terms of like he's going to talk about, you know, uh, uh, I'll try to get around the uh, YouTube sensors here. He's going to talk about corn. Um, and so he says, uh, you know, it's just it's just art. It's uh, it's a sex worker. It's an artist. Uh, Even the the adult film industry. The adult film industry, right? As if it's a reputable uh, business. I'm, a, that, I'm an adult actress. Yeah. Right. And I'm uh, an entertainer. I'm just an entertainer, and this is all just art, really. Um, no. And God's word has a lot to say about sexual ethics. Right. And God's word has a ton to say about the goodness of sex. And this is another one of those examples. It's yet another one of basically Brandon Robertson being manipulate, manipulative. And that's to say, on the one hand, you've got those who just say sex is gross and like it's immoral, but actually sex is beautiful. Gloriously good. It's good. It's so good. God makes it for our pleasure. And the Christian is listening to him going, wait a minute, I believe all that. Like sex is amazing and it's good and it's glorifying to God and it's awesome. And it's the best thing. It's one of my favorite, by the way, I'll go on record. It's one of my favorite things about the world with my wife, okay? Love it. And I'm allowed to say that because it's holy and good. The marriage bed is undefiled. Right. But right. Paul says the marriage bed is undefiled. Right. What Brandon is talking about is all defiled. Right. It's all defiled. It's not the marriage bed. He's turning human beings into beasts, animals. Precisely. Animals copulate mm -hmm. in the open. Animals copulate oftentimes with no relationship, no community. Animals will copulate in the open and sometimes without permission. Animals use the bathroom out in the open with no private places to do it. Yeah. Animals and beasts are like that. And what he is doing is he's turning human sexuality from something that is good and amazing and beautiful and stinking awesome. He's saying, no, let's throw it into the gutter and let's call mm -hmm. it art. Right? Let's call it art. You know, I, I'm reminded of uh, years ago this um, video that was circulating of the woman in front of like some art museum in New York, and she's standing up on on two platforms, uh, and she's mm. uh, dropping balloons um, from her hoo ha full and of paint. onto the ground, full of paint, and it's just splattering on the ground, and everyone looks and goes, "Oh, this." It's beautiful. This is so art. profound. It's so profound. It's amazing. And it all what it is, it's not art. It's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess. It's not art. It's not beautiful. There's no structure. There's nothing amazing there. It's There's random. nothing meaningful. It's all random. Exactly. Right. And there is such a thing as objective beauty. There is something as exactly. And what he wants to do is take what is beautiful, made by God with a purpose, and it is awesome, and it's extolled in this book. Sex is and the Glories of sex created by God are talked about highly in this book. Beautiful. It's amazing. But you can take what God made as amazing and good, and you can throw it into the gutter, which is precisely what this charlatan is doing. He's like, you can either believe like me that it's beautiful that these strangers are getting paid and don't love each other, and they're just doing this physical act with no concern for one another, no commitment to each other. Isn't that so beautiful? This man is consumed with lust. That's the truth, is the man is consumed mm. with lust, and so he can talk about something that is so degrading to humanity, and he could say it's art. Yeah. It's art. He, it's because you're consumed with lust, Brandon. That's why you think it's beautiful, because you're consumed with your lust, because Really, human beings, human sexuality is so meaningless that two strangers who've never met each other can walk into a room, get paid 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, or a woman can walk into a room for like a 50-guy gangbang, and you think that that's beautiful? That's beautiful? That's art? That's yeah. amazing? That's amazing human sexuality? There's no commitment these men have to her. They never met her in their lives. They're not going to care for her. That's beautiful? That's in the gutter. That's that's taking humans and turning them into beasts. And that's supposed to be something that 
is propped up in your worldview as a selling point for your position, believe me, it's garbage. You are selling hot garbage. You are taking the glory and beauty away from human sexuality, and you are turning human beings into nothing but animals. I think that's just the point, is the reason that he tolerates it is because he himself is sexually immoral. Yeah. He himself is riddled with sexual sin in his own life. His conscience is completely seared, and therefore he celebrates what God calls abominable, and that is the dehumanization of his image bearers, which is what pornography is, Mm -hmm. and anyone who partakes in it is you are becoming less like yourself. You are becoming less yourself in partaking of that, especially when the Bible talks about anyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. It's literally Romans chapter 1. Yes. He's taking what is immoral and calling it good. Yeah, and, 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 the, and you, 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 yeah. you made mention of seared conscience. Yep. Yes. Yep. Now, seared conscience... And that's the reason for the euphemisms, too, is because it doesn't allow him to confront the nature right. of his sin. Yeah, and, and but somebody could say, well, well, Zach, I mean, how do you know he has a seared conscience? It's like, well, because they have the Word of God. It says that God hands people over to their sin right. to that's love it. That's not objective, though. Right. It, it, God hands, it over, hands them over to their sin to love their sin. And so if you have a guy like Brandon Robertson who is claiming to love Jesus and openly promoting porn as beautiful good and amazing and that the people who do this are not immoral people i'm sorry brandon the bible actually says there is none righteous none good none who seeks for god all have gone all all have turned aside and gone astray so actually we're all immoral people we all have sin so first of all they're not immoral people yes ever all humanity is but actually when we talk about something they're not immoral people Brandon, by what standard is anybody immoral in your perspective? Because you're, you're trying to create a category of this is good, lovely, and beautiful. And you know what? These people who are doing this over here, they're not actually over here in the category of immoral. So we've got, we've got good, righteous, immoral, evil. Good and righteous, immoral, evil. Brandon admits that. He's, he's, he's not saying he's a nihilist. He's not saying he's a nihilist. He's saying there's actually something that's good. Yeah, there's and meaning. And something that's there's immoral. Purpose. And he's saying these people that do these acts over here, they're not immoral. Okay, the challenge is, and it always is going to be, Brandon, by what standard mm-hmm. are you measuring whether it's immoral? Is it because Brandon? Is it because in his little mind he believes that it's not immoral? Or is it the culture that we're currently in that says it's not immoral? Or is there a, actually an objective standard of something that it is right or wrong or immoral or moral? Is there a standard out there somewhere? Where can I find this standard, Brandon? Is it somewhere I can investigate or is, is it a book that I can open? Is there a standard for what is right and wrong? Because you're clearly applying it. You're saying that what they're doing isn't wrong. By what standard? Who says, Brandon? Because according to the scriptures, there is such a thing as sexual immorality. And we're even told in the Apostle Paul inspired literature, this is one instance, we're told that within a church context, if somebody is unrepentant in their sexual immorality, that the Christian people are not supposed to even eat with someone like that. To have no fellowship with them. If they're an unrepentant, sexually immoral person, they will not turn from it. They don't hate that sin. They love that sin. They pursue it. You're told in the church, have nothing to do with them. Don't even share a yeah, meal with exactly them. Exactly right. Because you're, not, you're only going to be helping them in their self-destruction. So that's what the scripture says, that there is such a thing as sexual immorality. And you're telling me that a woman who full-time, her job is to every is day to of the week... Be degraded. Is yeah. just to be degraded by men, yeah. multiple men at times multiple men on the same day to film a different video every single day with a different guy and she's not engaging in sexual immorality you are turning women into objects Mm -hmm. you're turning women into animals and you're saying that men can have a sexual union with a woman have no concern for her future no commitment to her whatsoever this is disgusting and you are extolling it as virtuous it's an amazing thing. It's, a, it's I think, just one more point on that. I think it, it's, it's incredible. The, the text that I referred to just a minute ago um, in Ephesians, anyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater. It's amazing the frequency with which Scripture addresses the sin of sexual immorality in the context of idolatry. If you look at mm-hmm. after God gives the law exactly. to Moses on Sinai, um, you know the people say, he's delayed in coming, uh, make for us an idol. That is the God who led us out of Egypt. And the people, 
immediately start engaging in what? Sexual immorality, um, mm -hmm. I idolatry, mm -hmm. right? W worshiping a false image of God. You know, they sat down to eat and they rose up to play. And that was the activity that they were engaged in, was the, the sexual destruction of themselves, that, mm -hmm. that perversion, um, that false worship of a false god, which uh, gives birth to a particular activity. One wonders, what is sexually immoral in Brandon Robertson's worldview? Yeah. One wonders, what actually is... Yeah, where do you draw the line? Well, because yeah. yeah. Brandon, no, yeah. he, he calls himself a reverend, but he doesn't believe that a woman or a man who engages in daily sex acts with strangers for money is sexually immoral. So there's no there's no need for personal relationship and commitment. Yeah. No need for covenants. Yeah. So prostitution's not far enough. And ready? <laughs> That's not your And line. and this is key. Clearly in the adult entertainment world, in the adult art world, there's no need for fidelity either. Mm. So no faithfulness, no covenant no commitment, no love. S uh, loveless sex is not immoral to Brandon Robertson. He says so, right? And so one wonders, pray tell, what is sexually immoral in your world? Pedophilia, I, bestiality? I think, right. I think his moral, I think where he would land on it is that's a contractual arrangement that that party enters in by consent. Loveless. I think that would be his, his standard is that, well. What about rape? Does he draw the line there? Well, and again, you'd These have, you'd have to questions. challenge and right. say, yeah, exactly. rape, pedophilia, molestation, yeah. why are those wrong? Who right. says, how about sex with animals? Yeah. I don't, you know, what about that? What about sex with literal animals? I mean, scripture has something to say about that, but I don't know if we could take that, you know, at uh, face value. Maybe we need to look at the background and look at all the stuff going on around, make an excuse for why actually we can have sex with animals today. But, you know, like most states in the union... Uh, actually have laws against bestiality. Mm. Um, or should we take those off the books, maybe? I don't know. I mean, what is sexually immoral, Brandon? What actually is against the rules? And question, who makes those rules, right? Uh, is there a way that God built the world that it's supposed to work? Um, where yeah. do we find that information? Is there a book somewhere that says that, that sort of lays down like the purpose of male and female and the purpose and, and, and of human sexuality? Is there a book somewhere I can find that information? Because I'd like to find yeah. it. And in order to actually condemn anything as a deviant behavior, he would have to have a standard to deviate from. Right. And and that standard, if it's operating within Brandon Robertson's own mind, I don't have to follow it because I don't share the same mind as Brandon Robertson. Mm -hmm. And so do you see the problem? If it's just societal norms and convention, it changes over time. You know, sometimes we're allowed to, you know, abuse black slaves, you know, but society, you know, they... They were fine with that, and so they forged ahead with it, and it was fine. You know, we changed our minds later, so we see it as immoral now, but it wasn't immoral then. You see the problem? Like, there's, there's just no place to plant yourself. Brandon Robertson is suspended in midair, and um, there's no foundation whatsoever, and he has no standards. And um, again, some of you guys might be saying, this is low-hanging of fruit. It's Brandon Robertson. Clearly, the guy is, you know, bad at what he does, and he's clearly an apostate well, in Charlotte. He's got a lot of likes and views. But he sure does have yeah. a lot of likes and views, and you know what? He's talking to the masses, and, uh, you know, it's the blind leading the blind for sure, but it's our duty to do what? Always provide a reasoned defense. And uh, in the context of dealing with an apostate like Brandon Robertson, who leads people astray, he is certainly one of those guys that deserves the, uh, the, the serrated edge that Paul gives in the book of Galatians uh, to the guys that were trying to distort the gospel over just this one little thing. Mm. Just enter into this. Just get the circumcision. Just do that plus Jesus. And he says, anybody that teaches you that is to be eternally condemned by God. And uh, this man, for sure, if he stays on the path that he is without repentance, and I certainly pray for his repentance, 100%. Brandon Robertson, you will face God in judgment without question, and I do not want that for you, but it is yeah, clearly right. the path that you're on. Yeah. One of the uh, most impactful things that we saw at the Ark Encounter here a couple weeks ago, um, they have this really cool display where they try to show you what life, what they think life would have been like prior to the flood. You know, so obviously it starts out with Adam and Eve in the garden, everything's beautiful, and then it's the hath God said, and then the next one, it just, like, there's, like, they have, like, these, I sent you guys a picture if you saw it, there's, like, these little, like, miniature models of things, and it just progressively gets worse, sexually worse, sexually worse, you know, and, like, where he's at, just whatever, like, sex is good, that's just whoever, you know, 
And then the next one is Molech. Then mm. the very next one is someone literally there's someone offering a child to this yeah. thing to burn it, you know, and it was like it's a great point. You know, just the degradation at each step and then boom, you got the flood. And that was really powerful to kind of walk through that and see yeah. just the mm. where things are at with mm-hmm. the culture. And, mm-hmm. It's a great point because <clears throat> Moloch worship is just self worship, but yeah. it's embodied in the state. <laughs> if you read what Rush Dooney wrote on that and describing, I think it was, it was a Francis Schaeffer. He was asked, what's the biggest problem that the church faces today? And his answer was statism. And statism is essentially Moloch worship. It's the mm-hmm. worship of one's own will as the ultimate. And when you have a society full of a bunch of individualized will worshipers, they will put people in power that reflect their values, mm-hmm. which is what we're seeing today. Yeah. The worship of self, the worship of a false god is embodied in the state. Yeah. And that is the uh, sure tell sign of a culture in mass decline and on the brink of destruction. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you to Sean Paradise for the gift, Amen. the thank blessing. You, Jacob Florentino, thank you so much. Matt, is it Verville? Verville? Verville. Uh, thank you for that. And the Fallen Waffle <laughs> asked That's a question. A great name. Is apology as yeah, great name. The, <laughs> is apology as Christianity and soteriology and exclusively lordship? Christianity and salvation. salvation. I'm not I don't sure how that was worded, but if you're asking if we believe that people need to repent of sin and trust in Christ, the answer is yes. Uh, when you come to Christ for salvation, you're coming to Christ to be saved, and that means you're coming to Christ as he is, and Jesus is Lord, and he is Savior. Um, Jesus uh, had words to say to people, why, why do you call me Lord? Lord, do, don't do what I say. And so, um, you know, absolutely, we believe that that a, a a true saving faith in Jesus is a repenting, repentant faith. Faith, and if you're coming to Jesus as Savior, um, of course, he, you're coming to Him to be saved f- from your sins, which means you're coming to Him for redemption, reconciliation, and peace. And you're coming to Him also, obviously, as Lord. I mean, how could somebody say that I trust in Jesus to forgive me my sins, but um, he's not the Lord of my life. How could somebody say that it shows a complete misunderstanding of what faith is in the New Testament? It is an empty hand, but it's an empty hand that really just grasps onto Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Like we're coming to him to say, save me, Lord. Please save me. Mm-hmm. I got nothing to offer you, but save me. You're clinging to Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? He's Lord of all. And the only hand that reaches is the heart that's made new. <laughs> that's really what links together those two. Like people usually uh, go one side or the other well are you lordship salvation you know is it jesus accept him as your savior but also as your lord have you done that yet and the, the thing that links the two together is the spirit's work of regeneration right right Amen. all right everybody thank you for watching today appreciate you let everyone know about the episode don't forget we have stuff happening over the next week if you just jumped on we have wednesday here in arizona a meeting about our bill in arizona for equal protection it's happening at 11 a.m arizona community church if you're a pastor come out we're going to give you lunch come out sit with us we're going to explain to you what's going on we're going to work together as the church to speak prophetically in this area for the pre-born and for the glory of jesus Amen. next friday i'm going to be in Colorado at in Denver State Capitol for the hearing on February the 17th for our bill with Representative Bottoms. I'd love for all of my Colorado brothers and sisters to come meet me there next Friday. Zach and uh, Carmen are going to be in um, Kentucky at the Kentucky State Capitol in Frankfurt next Friday the 17th. The week after that on the 25th, we're going to be in South Carolina for the rally for our bill in South Carolina. Be in prayer for us. EndAbortionNow.com is where you go to sign up for your church to save lives. At the mills, thousands upon thousands have been saved. Please join us in that work. But also an unprecedented thing happening right now this session is we have bills happening across the country, and it is amazing. All glory to God. Please pray for us. Please give at endabortionnow.com. Don't forget to sign up for all access at apologiastudios.com. we got some great stuff coming right now. There's a lineup right now already made. Uh, ready to drop with a new site and everything for all of our all access partners. We're grateful for you. We have so much more we're doing for you guys just to bless you and to thank you for all that you guys do with us, partnering with us in this ministry. It's all coming. Sign up now, be a part of this ministry. Um, and I was thinking, actually, I'll throw this out there. We're going to probably plan something in the next couple of months or so, some special thing for everybody signing, signing up for all access. Maybe we'll do one of our, we haven't done it for a while, like a meet fest. Someone come, we bring somebody out, to, uh, yeah. Uh, come Great. and hang out at the Foga. studio with us and Foga. maybe we'll do two or three people. We'll yep. bring you out and all that, but you got to be all access, send up for all access and uh, we'll get on with that. So that's Luke the bear. I was just going to say one thing I forgot. Um, 
our dear brother Bobby McCreary is in town right now. I actually asked him to be on today, but he's busy being faithful and stuff like he does. But uh, the Super Bowl is here this weekend, and I know there's going to be at least 100 faithful brothers out there mm-hmm. preaching the gospel. So he asked me to make sure, a reminder when to pray for them. And, pray for them. Yep. So, Luke the Bear. Peace out. Zach Conover. See ya. I'm Jeff, Common and Ninja. Catch you next week right here on Apologia Radio. Thank you for watching, guys.